Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Radically Loved podcast. This is Tessa. We have a very special guest on the show today. We have Thomas Hubel. Thomas Hubel is a renowned teacher, author, and international facilitator. His lifelong work integrates the insights of the great wisdom traditions with the discoveries of science. And so he's led um, several large-scale events and courses on the healing of collective trauma, a uh, special focus on the shared history of Israelis and Germans and facilitated healing and dialogue around racism, oppression, colonialism, and genocide. He's also the author of Healing Collective Trauma and the newly out in September Attuned, which I have the pleasure of holding here in my hands. If you're watching on YouTube, um, you could see what the cover looks like, and it's a beautiful one. So attuned, practicing interdependence to heal our trauma and our world. And Thomas, it's just such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you for being here. And how are you? First of all, thank you for having me. And I'm great. I'm running right now like a very big workshop with over 400 people here, like intense for a week. So where we do trauma healing and many things that we're going to talk about. So yes, I'm very happy to be with you. Wow. What a, well, thank you for taking time out of that to chat with us. I appreciate it. I, um, gosh, that, that sounds like a lot of amazing work, but also I wonder energetically how you keep yourself feeling charged, or maybe that does charge you. Um, and and able to show up fully in the present moment while facilitating a workshop like that right yeah it does actually charge me and i since i love so much what i do and uh, of course we are touching very painful you know things in our past uh, in the group so it's we, we are working with a lot of trauma but on the other hand the uh, relational in intensity, the attunement, uh, the the depth that we generate together and the presence that we generate together is simply amazing. So when you see like such a group grow day by day, you know, and it grows more together, there's more closeness, there's more flow, there's more openness uh, and intimacy in the group. So that's beautiful. So that's, that's deeply charging and rewarding also. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. Wow, very neat. Well, so when I speak to people such as yourself, I'm I'm always curious as to what drew you to this work. Uh, you know, how you found yourself walking down this path and um it seems to me like there's often a theme of feeling like being drawn to this work because of healing our own wounds, our own childhood wounds. Um, but I don't know, that might not always be the case, but I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit about your origin story, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think there are a few, um, like as a child, I always felt kind of drawn to to God, to spirit, but I, I, I didn't really resonate with the Catholic environment that in the village like I grew up outside of Vienna and it wasn't I don't know it wasn't warm it was I didn't really speak to me but the spiritual dimension spoke to me always and then another stepping stone was when I was 16 I joined uh, as a volunteer and it was around nine years then like I was a paramedic already very early on still while I went to school to high school and then while I was studying medicine at the time and um, and that was a big, I mean, that put me in touch with a lot of trauma, obviously, but I didn't know much about, like what I know today. I didn't know so much about trauma, but I 
it taught me a lot about so many walks of life. Uh, so I saw this as a big teacher for me this time. And then I left my medical studies when I was 26 and I went on a four year meditation retreat and started to meditate when I was 19. So um, I was four years in a deep immersion and uh, that taught me a lot. And and then I, I simply all the time felt, I mean, this I think was also the reason why I studied medicine, that healing and um, like the, the art of healing, but also the spiritual dimension, the mystical dimension of healing is simply something that I was deeply interested in. And um, yeah, and all of that together kind of formed my path. And then I got invitations to do workshops when I came back from this retreat. And I started with workshops, and then within those workshops, the and the, for my first workshops happened in the German-speaking area of Europe, and um, and then often the Holocaust, the uh, Second World War passed, came up, and uh, so it this kind of found me, like the interesting. I wasn't really inter- looking for collective trauma when I started my work, and. Um, I did a lot of relational work, a lot of mindfulness, contemplative work, mystical work. And then and then the trauma came up more and more. And so and then I started to study this uh, like deeper and research and look into the dynamics of collective trauma. And uh, and that became like a path. I'm doing this now 20 years. I, like I work with individuals and with large groups. And so we working with the interdependence of individuals and their ecosystems and the self-healing power that those ecosystems have. Mm, wow. How cool. So you, you mentioned if, um, your first, well, I don't, I want to put words in your mouth, but it sounded like one of your first touches with experiencing trauma or witnessing trauma was being a paramedic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to, this this brought up the subject of um, empathy versus sympathy when I heard you say that. And that you have a section in the book that addresses this specific topic, but I wanted to address it here in terms of when we have um, a felt experience that you can really empathize with, like somebody is going through, like they broke their arm and you've broken your arm as well. So you know exactly how that feels and the whole healing process and maybe surgery. So you can really truly empathize um, and versus something like sympathy, where maybe there isn't, you could imagine, but maybe you couldn't put yourself in their shoes. And I'm not even sure that I'm defining those correctly or the differences between the two, but I did want to touch on the subject of empathy in particular. How do we practice empathy? Um, and is it important to tease out the differences between empathy and sympathy? Yeah, I would say. It's beautiful what you're saying, because I would say there is the possibility that I carry, let's say I carry trauma. And then um, if I work the trauma to an extent that I could integrate some of the trauma into presence, growth, post-traumatic growth, then I think it really enhances my, my capacity to empathize. So the integration of trauma creates post-traumatic learning. It makes us wiser. It makes my perspective bigger. And I can can hold you more in me. I can feel you more in me. If you go, if you have a similar trauma in you, so I, I feel close to that. But I think also when we have undigested trauma inside, sometimes when somebody else comes with a similar trauma, it might also create the opposite that actually triggers me. And it brings up my pain when I see your pain. And so I think integration of trauma makes us wiser. And that's why many people that heal themselves actually can help other people to heal themselves because they went through it, they integrated it. And so they become a psychoactive substance in a way and they radiate it. And that's why I think healing is so important in our society because it's not only for ourselves. At first, it looks like it's for me, but actually it's what I am able to give to the world. And that's why many people, their trauma becomes also part of their purpose. Mm. You know, my my grandparents, for example, in Austria, I grew up in Vienna or around Vienna. 
my grandparents were of course in the second world war so when it's when we work a lot on the intergenerational trauma i got some some of it from my grandparents that experienced the big war and so i had to really deeply dive into that and and still maybe it will come up so then i i have to do my own work in order to be able in groups to work with people in their intergenerational trauma and my own opening makes me much more available on that level to hold the space for other people. So I think that's also the beauty that often, you know, when we talk about trauma, it seems like a stigma, something's not wrong, uh, something is wrong with me and not, I don't know. Yeah. But when we depathologize trauma and see how well, the trauma response is actually a very intelligent protection function. And when we work with it, we're actually dealing with our intelligence, not with something that's wrong or broken and so that accelerates the healing and then we can support other people so there's a for me there's a big beauty in in doing that work and i see also many people simply grow a lot uh that's beautiful yeah well yeah. okay so I, I definitely want to touch on the subject of trauma and so we're let's just head there right now um and i don't know if you can even extricate it from something like empathy anyways. So I think it makes sense to dive into this topic. And actually it's the section in the book I've been revisiting lately. This is uh, in part one, trauma's impact. Um, I've loved, by the way, I love all of the quotes that you have at each of the, each the beginning of the chapters. Um, this one stuck out to me in particular there is no present or future, only the past happening over and over again. That's Eugene O'Neill. Um, I have so many, I don't know if they're specific and direct questions as much as um, ponderings. So I'm going to try to articulate this to the best of my ability and perhaps you can help me. Um, so I think about the different types of trauma um, and more and more in our lexicon, I think we're as a collective becoming aware that there's a difference between something like big T trauma, little t trauma. Um, and I guess I'll just start with those in terms of understanding what we mean when we say trauma and not assigning it to those of us who only have what I guess I would call the big T traumas, like physical violence, rape, um, genocide, certainly things of that nature that are very big and overt and clearly traumatic events versus something like what I would consider a little T trauma, more microaggressions that might feel like neglect or, you know, in childhood, which I don't think we often always are able to acknowledge as having been through trauma. Certainly, I think something like the ACE study has helped us open our eyes to you know, how many of us have experienced trauma in our lives? Um, where am I going with this? I guess where I want to start with this is hearing in your words, what do we, because you have a very unique way of describing trauma, I think. I don't, I don't think I've, I've read a lot about trauma. I've experienced it personally, um, but you have a unique way of explaining it. I like how you've included um, this. It's almost kind of like a quantum physics lens into the experience of trauma with uh, a quote from Jana Levin. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that name correctly, but it's the Black Hole Survival Guide. So I'm going to stop talking now um, and let you add on to what I just started to say. If anything feels like you want to pull on that thread a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think it's fully right that many people identify trauma with I was a soldier in a war, I had a car accident, a sort of big surgery or abuse, like strong abuse. And of course, that's certainly true. And that leaves deep scars, of course. But I've seen also a lot in, especially like in, in societies where two, three, four generations ago, we had wars then the level of domestic violence, the level of non-attunement of parents to their children, the overwhelm of sharing with children or exposing to children too early trauma material because parents don't feel it and they overload their parents. 
as you said, microaggression, bullying, I don't know, many things that are happening that that are overwhelming or chronically overwhelming, they are also traumatizing. And and I think when we when we we often judge or we let's say like this, we I think trauma often has been normalized. Some people might say, oh, I've also been beaten by my par- parents or by my father. It sounds sometimes like, oh, I went to the grocery store and bought apples. You know, you 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 have sometimes a similar intonation or a similar um, intensity of the information, but one uh, sentence holds tons of intensity, but we don't feel it. So, and when we look, of course, that's a defense mechanism of the psyche to suppress the pain and to be able to interact with the world. But I think developing like a sensitivity that we do not, that we are less and less part of the normalization of trauma and that we more and more attuned to each other. And that's why I call the book attuned because I think Of course, there's empathy, but empathy can be trained in a way that my nervous system and your nervous system, as we speak, can create like a a togetherness. I feel you and I feel how you feel me is actually the basic building block of relating. And, And once we are connected, we can feel each other more precisely. And then we see when somebody speaks, we can feel Oh, the person speaks and suddenly they feel tight in their body. Their emotion is maybe absent or they're very stressed. Or So then I see the effects of the trauma, no matter if it's big T trauma or small T trauma, I can feel relationally how that feels. And the more open I am and available or present, the more I notice, and it's not that I always need to talk about what I feel, but just that somebody is in the room that feels it denormalizes it a bit and creates safe space, creates safe holding spaces, a deeper listening. And I think that means that all of us, not only professionals, all of us have a relational superpower, potentially. And that makes the collective, like that creates collective competence and makes the collective more and more space that could potentially be a healing ecosystem. And I think so there's individual empathy, but there's also some kind of collective empathy or attunement, like that there's a skill that the collective can develop. I see this in my groups now when I'm here with the group and there are hundreds of people and we feel we have very intimate one-on-one processes. Hundreds of people are witnessing and you feel like we're all together. Mm-hmm. And that creates a tremendous kind of healing space and and i think that of course that's an experimental small social ecosystem but it tells us how we can develop as societies and it will take us some time but attunement i think is a very important ingredient of healing individual healing ancestral healing social healing yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. I could I could sense that from you when you were describing it, the attunement. Um that mm-hmm. that's very powerful. So um oh, I want to dig a little bit deeper into this topic. And um I think my question around trauma, regardless of how we're labeling it as big T, little T, um it's important to acknowledge right? And to be able, well, I guess I'm wondering what you think about this. How, how important is it to be able to verbally process your trauma, to have someone hear you say out loud, what happened to you to, to be able to tell your story? And what if you feel like, I can't quite remember, maybe you had something happen in your childhood that's been suppressed and it maybe isn't it's not on the surface for you to be able to articulate but it feels like there's something off um so i guess i'm wondering how important is it to be able to articulate it and what if you can't really articulate it 
Right. Yeah, that's beautiful because it speaks okay. For some people that know their stories, sometimes it's really important for them to share their story. Why? Because suddenly there's a witness for that which hasn't been witnessed. Part of healing is that suddenly there is somebody that hears my pain, that really wants to hear my pain or wants to hear what happened to me and kind of confirms through deep listening the the situation that maybe when children were neglected or abused, there wasn't this, like another grown up in the room to say, no, that's not going to happen. This, this cannot happen. So there was no protection. There was no witness. And so we need that. But in our work, at least, we also see, okay, there is the mental story, but there is also an emotional narrative, there's a physical narrative, there's a relational narrative. So when we do this work, we pay a lot of attention. So we say our nervous system is a highly refined attunement uh, tool. And so when somebody shares the narrative, their physical body immediately shows how the trauma lives in their body. Mm -hmm. Their emotional experience shows immediately. If, I, if I'm a bit more sensitive or trained to listen to that, that means if even if somebody doesn't know the narrative or just parts of it and can't really have a coherent intellectual narrative, that, that doesn't really matter because if we are trained to listen, we see what the body tells us. And then we begin to work with the first symptoms that the body expresses that somebody feels a bit tight in the solar plexus they have i don't know tension in the chest in the neck in somewhere and and then we begin to listen to those symptoms and we listen to what the body tells us and usually when we are attuned the nervous system of the person that carries trauma feels safer when the nervous system feels safer it's it wants to detox because I believe we all have a self-healing mechanism in us. And when we create the, the environment that is conducive, then the nervous system wants to detox that material. And if you're willing to step by step go deeper, feel resourced enough, have a safe environment, a good holding space, then the body tells us everything. And then often the intellectual narrative, the memory, whatever that I can't remember will come back whenever it's safe for it to come back. Because some people might say, and this, we work a lot with the depathologizing of trauma and of all our defense mechanisms, because we could say, oh, I can't feel my body. We could also say, I managed when it was really painful to pull myself out of the body. We could say, I cannot Remember, we could also say not remembering saved me and is actually an intelligent function. So it's not something that is a kind of a dysfunction, it's a function. And when we begin to address trauma that way, then we are actually always working with the intelligence that was the best possibility for the person in that adverse situation. And that means when children were neglected and they needed to contract and hold themselves, and from that moment on, they carry a lot of tension and disembodiment in their body. That disembodiment was the best a child could do in that environment. And so, because often we relate to ourselves that something's wrong with me, but actually something was right, and we developed the attunement to communicate with what was right. And that's, and I see a lot of people changing their self criticism, their self judgment into actually a curious kind of looking or a curious inward journey to find out what actually worked. And that's much more empowering than when I'm simply dysfunctional, where some people say, I, I cannot ground myself really. Yeah, because there's a, there's a force that pulls out of the body. And if I begin to work with it, then I can ground myself. And the last thing, maybe um, some people struggle with not being present. But when we listen to what the trauma response says, it says here in space and time, 
in the traumatic moment, it's not good for me. So to be somewhere else in space or to be somewhere else in time is better. To pull out of the body, to split inside is better. And so even in the presencing of mindfulness work, I think being trauma-informed and noticing that not being present is maybe an intelligent function that protected that person helps us to work with it in order to become more present. So we're not working against the stream or against another movement. We're actually working with it to feel more embodied and present here and now. So that's why I think so just a few examples. Mm, I love that reframing of the purpose of um, disembodying ourselves from a, from a present moment. It definitely mm-hmm. serves a purpose. Uh, and I've always kind of considered it a negative thing. It's sort of when you hear people talk about it, oftentimes it seems like it carries a negative connotation. So I find that okay. very mm-hmm. helpful. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to, as it relates to relationships, and this is a theme, I mean, I think attuned is throughout a relational book. I mean, the relational field is a central theme in the book. Um, And when I think about relationships in particular, there, and as it relates to trauma, the idea of victimhood and perpetrator um, and healing these wounds, I often wonder, is it, if we have a relationship or if we want a relationship with the perpetrator, And, you know, we're at that place where we're feeling healthy and ready to um, heal this wound with someone who's harmed us in some way. Is there a good way to do that? Is there a safe way to do that? Is there a healthy way to do it um, in terms of maintaining relationship or healing relationship with those that have harmed us? Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course. I mean, we have worked with descendants or really people that well, let's say came from Nazi background families and Holocaust survivor families. So the, the the intensity of that relationship or victim perpetrator dynamic is very strong. So what I would say is, first of all, we need to work on the trauma integration to a certain extent that somebody can stay in the room when whatever transgressor is also in the room. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense because there's such a strong disembodiment that nothing really, nothing healing or meaningful can happen. And um, so we need to do our inner work to a certain extent that we that we actually feel the, the willingness, even if it's challenging, that we feel the willingness that uh, we want to restore that relationship. Because I, I believe in what I've learned from the work is that in the moment there's a transgression and somebody hurts somebody, there is an entanglement between the victim and the transgressor. There's kind of a locked relationship anyway. Mm-hmm. It's not visibly locked, even if the people are on the other side of the world, but there's kind of an entanglement because we broke in a way an ethical law or the human rights. And that creates something. The second thing that I've seen is in the moment somebody hurts somebody, there's a kind of what I call a shadow drama being copy pasted into the transgressor. So the hurting somebody hurts us, even if we don't feel it. So I'm not saying everybody is aware of that, but when we when we begin to create restorative processes, so both sides actually need to work through something in order to be able to restore relationships. And I have seen like tremendously powerful moments when we had these groups where people from different sides came together, like Jewish people that got hurt and, and people with Nazi descent, a lot Nazi family background. And, and even if, of course we needed to work, it's intense work, but I have seen amazing restorative moments like that felt so sacred because of the strong background. And then we do it right. And in a, in a attuned way and with the right ingredients, I've seen restorative processes that you can, you just start to cry because it's so touching. 
and and you feel wow now something sacred is happening like life restores something that seemed like a big gap that can never heal really but it's not true and we felt also the tremendous presence in the room in those moments as if life wants to heal it if you know the steps that need to be taken to get to that point are being taken so some people feel so hurt they cannot be in such a process they need first the individual work and a safe space and then but we we can do it and sometimes we also work with different groups that one group does the work the other group does the work and when it's ripe we bring them together and um uh, but i have seen amazing amazing moments in groups and you could really see also how people change physically how their emotions change how patterns recurrent patterns that they had in their life changed uh and it's fascinating so i think to create more like a collective healing architecture that like slavery and racism or native american genocide in the us we need an architecture like that it this is public health this is collective health so we don't have yet an architecture that is supported by the country to take care of its legacy we also don't have it in germany we need to you know or in rwanda or in in latin america where we work on colonialism we need to establish that i believe and and like that we could literally change the course of many many events and i think it's an amazing investment in to in public health to to work on those systemic legacies and so yes that work is needs a lot of attention it's not just easy but it can have a tremendously rewarding outcome i think yeah oh i love this idea i my father uh, it, before he retired he was um he was a victim offender mediator. So he would often mm -hmm. be at that point with someone who uh, was a victim and maybe somebody who was in jail would bring them together to have a meeting and a reconciliation and um, just like an acknowledgement of wrongs and an apology. So I, I'm just so hopeful for that kind of work. I remember it being groundbreaking back in early 2000s, I think is when he was doing mm -hmm. that work and so it's amazing to hear you say on a grand scale, systemic change is possible and you've seen it um, happen at such a, a larger level. And to hear about the ideas of like creating an architecture for it, that's that sounds really cool. I uh, I mean, more than cool, cool is an inadequate, inadequate word there. <laughs> um, <laughs> one... Uh, I think there's one last thing I want to touch on in terms of trauma, and then I want to uh, move in a different direction. And if you'll indulge me, I wanted to read just a short paragraph from the book. I'm on page 96. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is, you're, you're writing about trauma. Another difficult to fathom phenomenon is the one we call trauma, aka karma or shadow. Like the astrophysicist black hole, trauma can be sensed as an absence or nothingness that barricades its secrets and, however strange, has a distinct location in space and time. This is kind of what I was referring to and I was describing almost like this quantum physics uh, lens mm -hmm. of trauma. Um, and then you go on to say, although a person's past traumatic experiences are often invisible, secrets never to be revealed. They simultaneously exist as a great density of energy, powerful enough to disfigure the very fabric of reality. The closer we get to one of these traumatized zones, the stranger things appear. This is what kind of hooked me. The stranger things appear. Then the stranger things appear. Um, and I kind of paused and I was like, hmm, why do, why do you think, because it's outside the realm of what we would consider normal. I was wondering if you would indulge me in mm -hmm. explaining mm -hmm. stranger. Mm. Yeah, because what, like when we look at what, when a traumatic event happens, there is a very strong impact onto a living system. Let's say a human being can be an organization, can be a society, can be the biosphere. So there's like a, 
there is a, a strong impact. What happens in the system because of that tremendous amount of stress, either we go into fight, flight, or freeze. So there's tremendous stress, and the nervous system has the power to shut down a part of that stress and in order to survive better. So because with that overwhelm, we can't survive. So, so it shuts it down so we can still do things, run away, save ourselves, I don't know. And But that shutdown becomes an absent, numb, suppressed part. I often say trauma is like, imagine you see a war scene on the TV. Then you take your remote control, you mute the TV, and you still see the scene, but now it's muted. And then you take the TV and you throw it into the ocean. And then you see slowly how the TV disappears in the water. And now let's imagine that when there are systemic traumatizations, that the ground of the ocean is full of TV sets that are still playing their scenes in the unseen. Mm-hmm. That's what Jung would call the collective unconscious. But it's not that what's in that the intensity in the shutdown is not gone. There's a tremendous amount of energy, but it's now shut down and appears in us oft, often as an it. Or, first of all, we don't feel it, but if symptoms arise, they look like strange to us. We don't know where those symptoms come from because we don't feel this absent part. And so when we look at relationships, when we talk to somebody, I think we are not yet, as collectively, we are not yet skilled to notice that people, when they speak about things, especially when they speak about things that they are struggling with, Mm -hmm. often they don't feel their physical or emotional experience. So Mm -hmm. they, they tap into some numbness and absence, which is overwhelm. But since we often don't feel that that happens, it keeps happening over and over again. So... Absence is almost like a bit of a black hole. It's like it, it swallowed information and is shut down. But it doesn't mean that that's shut down. So when people meditate, for example, then you can see some people rest really in spacious awareness and they can witness whatever comes up in them. Some people r- touch this, this kind of absent parts in themselves, but it also looks like I'm witnessing something but i'm actually not anymore connected to my inner to the information flow and so that dissociated meditation and that connected meditation make a huge difference and and so that that estranged information that is other often appears as as other that's when the whole good and evil story comes into play because all the information that's suppressed has effects, but we don't know how these effects come into life. So we kind of made stories about it. Reowning though the split information creates integration, creates less othering, less polarization, less fragmentation in our societies and more inclusion, more openness, more collaboration, more of many things that we actually desire, that we want to see more of in the world. And the last thing that fits a bit to the quantum mechanic stuff, I think that in presence, presence is when there's trauma, unintegrated history is the past, integrated history is presence. So everything, all the ancestors that led up to you and all the ancestors that led up to me, actually the integrated part has this conscious conversation. So that's not past, that's the history that is able to have this conversation because most of our brain functions and our liver and our emotions, we didn't develop. They developed over a long period of time. And But unintegrated, this unintegrated split of information is the past. That's why often we walk around in life where people walk around and say, okay, I'm scared of them, I feel insecure. But that insecurity has nothing to do with this moment. It has something to do with our past. And it keeps recreating itself. So that's why I put in the book also 
there are a lot of similarities between what we know about trauma and what maybe Eastern traditions or traditions call karma mm -hmm. is postponed experience. And so integrating postponed experience creates wholeness, creates unification. So that's why I think the spiritual traditions for a long time also described in a way trauma without calling it trauma, but there's, it's not that it's an entirely new concept. We have now just more science data about it. Yeah. Yeah. And new words to explain it. <laughs> well, <laughs> exactly. I don't know if they're new words, but newer for us, I suppose. So, okay. Uh, the, the other topic I wanted to hear you talk more about is extended mind theory. Um, when I read this section, I started to think about this idea of collective consciousness. And when I, when I say that, I think of how there's can be this phenomenon of this um, idea occurring simultaneously across thousands of miles between people who aren't even really interacting with each other. Um, and so I'm not, that's where I went with extended mind theory. And I don't know that that's exactly what you're explaining. Um, but I would love to hear you talk about extended mind theory. Exactly. Exactly. It means that because sometimes we might think our mind is just in our brain and it's kind of this limited separate box and all the data is in there. And the like mystical traditions for a long time, but I think also science experiments show, wait, it's not just, that clear cut, maybe the mind is not just in me, but maybe the mind is also in everything I write. I, I don't know, I use my phone, I use like things that have data that belong to me. I share photos, there are experiments that, you know, that when, when you share, like for example, the photos of your um, holiday trip, your vacation with others, you actually, you're, your your vacation starts to live in their mind and you have a shared territory like a shared part of on a hard disk or a cloud and so that the mind is not just in us it's also in everything that we produce that we put parts of our mind into substance into objects photos and so on and then it continues even more that, that we say okay the our brains while we and our bodies, our nervous systems, while we have this conversation, there's a lot of data flowing. There's our intellectual framing of what we are aware of, but there's a lot of data flowing. And not only between us, but between everybody, like all of us, all the people that are listening to this right now, also begin to participate and attune to this conversation. So we could say, if there are many people listening now, you and I actually happen in the nervous system of many, many people. Mm -hmm. So there is a whole field because in you, in my nervous system, you are energy. You are brain waves and energy data. And I am in you also data. So the more we are tuned to each other, that internal representation becomes clearer. We call this closeness, intimacy, understanding, clarity, whatsoever. But for example, if thousands or hundreds of thousands of people tune in with something, it, it creates a strong, a strong field. So the mind is actually becomes a shared space. Same as I believe healthy emotions are not separate. Fear is only separate because we often didn't feel supported enough to co-regulate that fear with others. But fear can also be a connective tissue. Fear is energy that brings children back to their parents into a safe space. And the parents can receive their children. It becomes an attuned, safe space. And the fear becomes a shared experience. And so... That's why I think the extended mind theory is actually describing something that is very fundamental to life. And because there is such a high degree of systemic trauma, we, we are not fully aware of it because we feel too fragmented. But that's, I believe, humanity's basic state. That's actually how we can live when we heal more and more of the trauma. We, are, we will become more and more aware of 
the fact that we are all connected. And now we have this word, the cloud, where we all store stuff on the cloud. We are actually really living as a cloud, but sometimes we don't feel that. Sometimes the data connection to the cloud is a bit uh, limited. Um, and that's why we feel more separate. Mm. It's, I think that's very exciting. Yeah, I agree. I would agree, especially in this very, very digital age where, you know, you and I, prior to COVID, we would have probably figured out a way to have a podcast in person, maybe. Um, or typically that was more often the norm than having a Zoom conversation. So uh, I'm thinking about how do we integrate these very powerful, very cool technologies with our need for human connection and interrelation, interpersonal relationships. Um, you know, certainly I feel that a uh, vibration, just having this conversation with you, I get what you're saying about extended mind field, but I also feel like I'm missing human interaction. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do we integrate these two things? Yeah, I think both. I think digital spaces cannot replace physical meetings entirely. I mean, we, we want, I see it also now, we are here with a group with so many people and it's simply amazing to be in person. We run also a lot of large online programs um, where we also do a lot of very deep work. So it's the, it's the similar quality of work is possible also online, but sometimes also the social interaction, everything that's besides that happens besides the interactions in a group, uh, when you go for lunch, when you sit together, when you, you know, when you dance together, when you have fun, I mean, there some things are not replaceable that easily. Um, but I see a lot of attunement possible through the digital space. And then we begin to feel, wow, we're actually thousands of miles apart, but we can actually feel each other pretty well here. And if we were to go into like some kind of process work, we could follow each other's process pretty uh, precisely if, if you're trained and if you want that. And so I think the having a training how to kind of bridge what because the, the digital space can be a 2D space or the digital space can become a three-dimensional felt experience. And so sometimes we need to change a bit something in our mind and begin to feel attuned to each other. But then I have seen large-scale online events where we had very deep work done that was felt so intimate that we almost forgot that we are in a, in a digital space. And I think mixing that up with um, real like physical meetings, uh, I think we need to find a regulated balance. Uh, but I think we have amazing possibilities. It, in, it increased the range. I mean, you and I wouldn't be here most probably in this conversation without Zoom. So Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Thomas. I, I want to be mindful of your time. I'm wondering if there is any... So I'll ask you two questions and you can decide which one you'd rather answer. I'm wondering if there's any thing that you hoped to touch on in this conversation that we didn't quite get to, or if there, if you want to share the reason or the takeaway from writing attuned and when people pick it up, what you hope they would take away from it. Maybe I can speak to both a little bit sure. because one thing that I wanted to share before is I think when we talked about big T, small T trauma, I said, I thought it's very important to see that if we depathologize trauma, of course, trauma always stems from painful experiences in the past. But once we carry that inside, that that's a, a great invitation to grow. That's a great invitation for us to find ecosystems that support us to grow. So we don't need to do it alone. We can do it together. But reframing our internal processes that we usually judge is tremendously helpful to become more interested so that I'm always exploring intelligence and not uh, some kind of minuses or limitations or dysfunction. So I think that that's one. And that always trauma healing creates post-traumatic learning. So we learn something, we grow, it creates 
kind of an ethical learning often. So we grow as human beings and we are more able to receive the world, which I think is wisdom to be able to, to feel and receive more of the world in, in our perspective. And with the tuned, I think, I think that our nervous system has tremendous capacities. Attunement can intensify and enrich and deepen our relationships like incredibly much. And so when we, so one takeaway from attunement can be that when we begin to practice that, we see that we all, first of all, can intensify our relationships that we already have. We can also develop a collective competence for this. We don't need to be specially trained trauma therapists, but we all have a relational superpower. And we know from research that people that go through adversity, if they have positive experiences, so the ACES study brought out the PCES study, positive childhood experiences. And we know that when we when we really need help and somebody is there and helps us, it reduces the trauma after effects. And we remember those moments as deeply empowering. And so we all can be that person that can be in the right moment somewhere where somebody needs it and we can receive it from other people. And, and the last thing, maybe I think attuned describes also the trauma is not just a personal experience. That is a part of my biography. The individual trauma, the ancestral trauma, and the systemic trauma, they are a system. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a standalone thing. Attachment trauma comes because our parents are traumatized too, and their parents most probably were too. So that's why they couldn't hold us, not because they were vicious in most of the cases, but because they simply didn't have the bandwidth to do it. And and seeing that trauma is a whole system, I think gives us much more access to healing capacities. And um, so I think it's important and attuned, uh, I think this describes what I call the IAC, Individual Ancestral Collective Trauma System or Fluidity, like that we can liquefy that. And that's, I think, also important for collective issues like climate change or global collaboration or anti-racism work or you know anti-Semitism work or decolonizing our world. So there are so many big issues, I think, where relational capacities are the remedy. Mm, yeah. Mm. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you for the work that you do and for sharing this with us. Uh, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, is there any particular place that you, that you want to point listeners to in terms of connecting with you and following along and in terms of social media outlets and things like that? Yeah, my works represent, I think, on all big social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, Twitter. And um, but it's my website, thomashubel, H-E-B-L.com, thomashubel, uh, H-E-B-L.com. And also our uh, non-profit, we have a non-profit where we do a lot of collective trauma work uh, through our NGO and that's the Pocket Project, pocketproject.org. So these are two places that where people can see the richness of uh, how we can participate in, in giving back something to society. Mm, wonderful. Well, I'll make sure those links get into our show notes so that people can easily just drop down the info button right below the podcast link and connect with you there. And uh, maybe one, one more thing that I forgot is that we have an annual collective trauma summit, collective trauma summit.com. And there, you know, many people like we have such a big list of speakers and, and I think that could be also an interesting uh, kind of resource for people to learn more about from an interdisciplinary conversation and great, great speakers. Yeah. yeah. Is it the same time each year? Is it in? Is yeah, it it's coming up in September, the last week of September and October. It's nine days with, I think, 60 or 70 speakers, 100,000 people participate every year. So it's a big thing. Yeah. Wow. So great. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's definitely make sure that gets into the show notes as well. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, right. and thank you. Thank for having you. me here. It was lovely. I felt like a lovely resonance between us. It was beautiful. Oh, yeah, yeah, likewise. 
Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved Podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast, and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta, and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com. <laughs>